You have a plan and a purpose for each one of our lives. Lord, I pray that the Word of God would touch our hearts and cut our hearts where it needs to be cut, where it needs to be touched. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah, I, yes, I, I know the Sherry. What does it say? It says, All I need today is a little bit of Huskers and a whole lot of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 the thing that made me cry is we didn't even get a little bit of the Huskers. Just a smidge, you know. Don't get me started. You know, I could go without pro football. Couldn't care less. Pro basketball. And I love the UFC. And college football. I love college football. So this is going to be unusual for you. But that's okay. We're going to be in the book of James today. James is in the New Testament. It's right after the book of Hebrews. And so... I've been on this all week long. In my quiet time, I've been reading James and... James is, is a powerful book, and it's one that needs to be understood and read and soaked in. James was, you know, there's a lot of questions about who the author is. The author of this book is James, not the son of Zebedee, and not James the son of Alphaeus. It is James, the brother of Jesus. There, you find him back in the, in the Gospels uh, that he didn't believe. And James didn't even come to faith in Jesus until after Jesus rose from the dead. His family did not really believe he was the Messiah. You know, here, all of a sudden, because Jesus had brothers and sisters. Some people think he does, but that's not true. There's nothing unholy about having children in a godly way. So Mary had children and uh, other children besides the master. And so, but all of a sudden, here's these children, and it says it all over the scriptures that 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 uh, many places where Jesus' brothers and sisters came to him, and they didn't really know that he was the Messiah. Mary knew, Joseph knew. They both had angels speak to him, to them about him, about the birth. And uh, so after the resurrection, though, James became an extremely influential leader in the church of Jerusalem. He was a very powerful man of God. And he was very straightforward. I love James's gospel because he doesn't beat around the bush. Most of them don't. But James is an in-your-face. James is a no-holds-bar teacher, leader. He says things that you just can't get away from. Uh, there's just not a lot of compromise in his messages. He says, in, es in essence, if you're going to be a Christian, then be a real one. You know, some people are Christian by name only. Would say I go to church, I carry a Bible, I have a cross around my neck, I wear a Jesus shirt, but my life does not reflect Jesus. The word Christian means Christ one, one like Christ. So to be a Christian, it's not just to get out of hell free card, it's a transformation. And James is going to talk about this, where we have an encounter with Jesus, there's a spiritual transaction, and the Spirit of God comes to live inside this vessel, and they become new. And as life goes on, over the years, they are being transformed from glory to glory. I'm not the same man I was 35 years ago when I gave my life to Jesus. I was a radical. I mean, I was radically changed by Jesus. But I was really ignorant. I mean, I was preaching to the trees almost, you know. And I'd preach to people even if they didn't want to. I'd get into arguments with people. Uh, and they couldn't beat me in the arguments because I'd be arguing with people who didn't know the word. And I'd win all the arguments, but I didn't win any converts for Jesus. So I had to learn over the years, you know, that you catch more flies with, with honey than with salt. In other words, when you love people for Christ's sake, they love you back. They respond to love. The Holy Spirit said to me many years ago, and I spoke this in large churches, affluent churches, I said, this is what God dropped in my heart. He said, love is the missing jewel in the crown of the church. <laughs> The church has many jewels in her crown, but without love, what did Paul say? If I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I'm a noisemaker. The church has not been loving people. It's easy to give somebody something, but when you give it in love, people know the difference. Don't you know the difference? I've had, there was a pastor from North Omaha came here uh, a couple of years, last year or so. He sat right there. He wept the whole service. When service was over, I asked him, Pastor, are you sick? He said, no, I'm not sick. He said, I don't feel the love in my church that I feel here. He said, I feel the Spirit of God here in such a powerful way. And that is because we've been praying for years. God teaches how to love your people. Love is the power of the gospel. 
Why did God so love? Uh, why did God send Jesus? God so loved the world. That's why He gave His only begotten Son because of love. The Bible says in Matthew, when Jesus saw the crowd, they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion on them. He loved them. So we as Christians, we need to learn to have compassion on people. Sometimes we react to somebody. If someone's being a butthead, we generally react in kind. But when Jesus would encounter somebody, he, would, he knows what's wrong with them. Sometimes we need to find out why someone is the way that they are, rather than just being critical and giving it back to them with a double barrel. That's compassion. That's love. It's going the extra mile. And this is what James is talking about here. He's talking about what a Christian should be, what a Christian looks like. It's about living out your faith every day in every situation so that people can see that you walk in victory with Christ. You know, if somebody accused you of being a Christian, would they have enough evidence to condemn you? Because Again, going to church don't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. It's what's in your heart. It's what's in your heart. Is Jesus living in your heart? So James really goes right after this. He opens up talking about trials and effects. And the trials are for a reason. So we're going to get into this. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes dispersed abroad. Greetings. Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, when you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. In God's providence, you have bad days on purpose. Sometimes God allows us to have bad days. Sometimes God lets us go through difficulties because it makes men and women out of us. It makes us mature in the Lord. You know, you don't expect little children to understand things, but when you go through life and you've had some bumps and bruises and you've learned at the school of hard knocks, you start to mature. You don't do some of the same stupid things that we used to do. Thank God. I wrote the book on stupidity. I did some stupid things when I was a kid. You know, when you're a certain type of age, you think you're indestructible. And the fact that I made it to 17 or 18 years old is a miracle of God. You know I know God had his hand on my life. Because there was a couple of times I almost died. And just oblivious. Young people today are the same way. Think that they don't have any, they seem not to have any appreciation for life. That's how some of these kids nowadays, they just could shoot somebody and have absolutely no remorse whatsoever. No love. No love. So James is telling us that we're going to go through things. A trial is a divinely ordained difficulty that God causes or permits that he may grow us and conform us into the image of his son Jesus. So rather than complaining, why me, why me, poor me, poor me, why don't we say, God, you know what I do when I'm going through the fire? I'll say, Lord, teach me this lesson. Let me learn the lesson soon so I can get out of school. Because one thing I learned, if you don't learn the lesson, you're going back to the beginning. You'll learn that lesson until you go through that lesson until you learn it. So I just as soon learn. Because folks, first grade comes second grade, then comes third grade. So when you learn these lessons, other trials are coming. And the older you get and the longer you walk with Jesus, you learn to face these things. And faith becomes your platform. Faith becomes your foundation, and you're not blown and tossed to and fro after the doctor gives you a bad report. Or the stock market crashes, or you lose your job, or your wife, uh, and you had a bad fight, or you're going through the book. God will get you through whatever it is if you trust in Him. And so that's what James says. Now, God doesn't cause us, and it's not God's will for us to divorce, okay? I'm not saying that. But He allows things to happen oftentimes, and sometimes He stirs things. Remember last week we talked about Jesus said to the disciples in Mark chapter 4, let's go to the other side. So they get on the boat. Jesus is tired. He takes a nap in the back of the boat. While he's sleeping, the waves come, the winds come, water's coming over the boat, and the disciples think they're going to drown. They go wake up Jesus. Lord, don't you care? We're going to drown. Jesus woke up, got up, stood on the boat, said to the wind and the waves, peace, be still, and it was. And then he said, 
Why are you of little faith? I mean, didn't Jesus say, let's go to the other side? Now, if he said, we might get to the other side, maybe I'd have been worried. But he didn't say, we might get to the other side. He said, you're going to get to the other side. Jesus promised us that he will be with us. He said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That is how Christians, when they were thrown to the lions in the Roman Colosseum, could, could stand there and allow these lions to come out, stand in groups, sing praises to the Lord as they unleash, unleash these beasts to tear them up. Because they, they have faith in Jesus. They knew that this death would be a momentary thing, and the next thing they're going to see is the face of the one who died for them. That's what Christianity is all about. It's living at your life for Christ. And actually, going further, Paul said, it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives within me. So it's not a line with Steve, you know. It's Steve. I just say, Jesus, live your life for me. Some of you I probably told one morning I was getting ready to go to work, and I do dream and I have visions from time to time. Uh, this particular morning, I had five minutes to go. I was tired, and I thought, I'm just going to take five minutes before I really have to go, and I want to pray. So I didn't fall asleep. So I sit down, and I shut my eyes, and immediately I see in my mind a vision of me standing face to face with the Master. Jesus looking face to face with me in this vision. And then suddenly, he walked into me and turned around. So there was two of us, and when he walked into me, he disappeared, and then it was just me. And he was saying to me, it's no longer you who lives, Steve. I want to live my life through you. So when you pray for people and put your hands on them, that's my hands. And when you're loving on them, that's my heart. And when you're giving and feeding them, I'm giving and feeding. What did Jesus say? When you feed the least of my brother, you're feeding me. Mother Teresa said, when I look in the face of the, of the poor, and I mean, she was talking about poor. She said, when I look in the face of the dying and the poor, I see the distressing disguise of Jesus. Don't become a theologian. Be a Christian. Be a follower of Christ. And this is what James is saying. James, or Romans tells us, Paul says, we know that uh, those who love God, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. So when you're going through a storm of life, watch God turn around and use that as a blessing. Yeah. I preached a, a funeral. I didn't plan on saying this, but uh, for my dear sister Diana's grandson, a number of years back, he... he Guy, he was skateboarding. He was wearing a skateboard or a shirt that said "Skateboarding for Jesus," and it was a freak accident. The little boy wasn't wearing a helmet, and he fell backwards, and it didn't seem to his friends that he hit his head very hard, and he got right up, and then he passed out, and he never did wake up again, and it was crushing, and it broke my heart for for Don and Diana, of course, for for uh, for your, uh, his parents. I couldn't really make a lot of sense out of it. You know, sometimes people ask me why things happen. I, I don't have all the answers. I don't understand God's economy. But when I preached at that funeral, uh, I, I preached the word. And I gave people an opportunity to come to Jesus. And boy, I could hear the spirits out there. Well, about two years later, a guy that worked for me moved into a new neighborhood. And uh, I said, well, how do you like your new neighborhood? He said, great. You know, there's a kid that's befriended my friend, my, or my son. They're just really good friends. He said, this kid's really on fire for Jesus. He's always talking about Jesus. And that was, was DJ's best friend who gave his life to Jesus when I did that funeral. Oh. And now he's living next door to him, and that kid is sharing the gospel. So God can make, I don't understand, but who knows? So, you know, when you're flying in an airplane, you see things that you can't see when you're down here on the interstate. God sees things that we just don't see, and we just have to trust that he knows. He knows. And we have to trust Him. So when the good times come, that's why it says in, what, in marriages, in good times and in bad times, in sickness and in health, for richer, for poor, till death to His part, there's a reason. That's the same thing. Was a Christian, I'm going to walk with Jesus until I don't breathe anymore. And then, I'm going to, I'm going to fly. Yeah. Open my mouth. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Um, now, He says here, if any of you lack wisdom. He should ask God who gives generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, not doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. 
That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, for a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. We have too many double-minded people in the church today. We're praising the Lord on Sundays, and we're dancing with the devil the rest of the week. Saturday night, party time. Then we come to church and repent for all the sins we did Saturday night. People, you're looking at somebody who used to party hard. It's a wonder I'm alive. There were times I had so much drugs in my system that my heart was beating out of my chest. It's a wonder my heart didn't stop. My family's got heart disease. But you know, stupid kids, we don't know. You know, I'm, I'm indis you know, indestructible. I wasn't. What I didn't realize is God had a plan for my life. And he changed my life 35 years ago. But I'm so glad. And he didn't just change me. It's not that I don't do drugs. Because that which you obey, that's your master. Did you know that? If you're a slave to sin, that's your master. If you're a slave to alcohol, that's your master. If you're a slave to pornography, that's your master. If you're a slave to lying, that's your master. If you're a slave to your wife or your husband, that's your master. I happen to be a slave of Jesus. And the more I surrender my life to Jesus, the more free I am. And that's the truth. Because the Bible says you've been called to freedom, brethren, but don't use your freedom as an opportunity to sin, but through love be servants of one another. I don't know many Christians that are servants. Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Did you know that Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, he washed his disciples' feet? Isn't that amazing? Jesus, God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus spoke it all into existence. Then he humbles himself, gets down on his knees, and he washes his disciples' feet. But then what did he say? Now you go and do likewise. I remember one time we did a foot washing here when we first moved into this church. And we had some homeless guys came in who were the roughest feet I ever seen in my life. And I was so humbled to be able to do that. We should do that more often. So, but we can't be double-minded. We've got to be set in our ways. We need to know wisdom. And you know what he says? If you lack wisdom, I'll take it further. If you lack anything, ask God. If you don't have faith, ask God. Lord, give me more faith. I do it all the time. You don't read the word, ask God. Charlie, give me a few steps, please. Whatever you need, ask God. You have not because you ask not. And some of you just ask. And then you give up. The Bible tells us that there was a persistent widow. She wanted something from the Lord. She asked and kept asking and wore him out. And finally he turned around and gave him what she wanted because he wore him out. You know there's seven levels of intensity of prayer. The Bible says you ask. And then if there's no miracle, you seek. And then if there's no miracle, you knock on the doors of heaven. And if you still have no miracle, you fast your prayer. And if you still don't have a miracle, you weep your prayer. And if you still haven't received your miracle, you vow your prayer. And then if you still don't have a miracle, you wrestle with God. When my grandson was in a coma and the doctor said he might not wake up after a football accident, I told the Lord, I went through all seven of them. Finally, I got to number seven. And I said, God, I'm not going to leave here until you give me what I asked for. I grabbed onto him, just like I got him in a rear naked shoulder. Of course, he would have let me put it on him. But I said, I'm not leaving here until you give me what I asked for. And then suddenly, after a while praying, I knew he was going to wake up. Doctor said he's not going to wake up. He might wake up, might not. You know what? He woke up the next day. Jesus overruled God. So, there's seven levels of intensity of prayer. I want you to remember that. I see some of you writing that down. God wanted you to hear that because you're going through something in your life. And you've been asking and asking, but you're not getting your answer. So then you ask and then you seek and you knock on the doors of heaven. God! Please, I'm still here. And when you fast your prayer, you're saying to God, I mean business with you. I'm turning down my plate. I'm not going to feed myself. I'm not going to comfort myself. 
You know, when you fast, if you have a medical condition, don't do it unless you check it out. But when you go without food for a number of days, your spirit becomes so intense. You become really, really keen in the spirit of God. Because as your body is afflicted, your spirit then gets stronger. Remember, that which you feed the most is going to be the strongest. You feed your flesh with garbage, garbage is what you're going to get. Uh, your greatest lessons of faith are often learned in the dark. Remember that. So it's these times when you feel like you can't see the sun, the sun's going to be there. Let the brother of humble circumstance boast in his exaltation. But let the rich boast in his humiliation because he will pass away like the flower of the field. For the sun rises and together with scorching wind dries up the grass and its flower falls off and its beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. He says let the humble person, let the person of low esteem uh, be thankful or boast in his exaltation that he is being made like Christ. So when you're going through difficulties, that's good. You're not boasting, what can I talk? You're like, no, you're saying, I don't want nothing, Lord. I want you. I don't need a new car. I want you. I don't need a new house. I want you. I want you. See, most of you guys don't get that. There was a, uh, I'll give this to you. Some of you heard it before, but some of you have. It's really important to tell it. There was a man one time who was a tremendous art dealer. He spent millions of dollars on an art collection. When his uh, son went away to Vietnam, his son befriended a fellow who was a, an artist, not, you know, not world class, not Rembrandt or anything, but he could sketch. And he sketched a picture of this man's son while they were over in Vietnam. And sadly, that son never came home. He was killed in action. When the war was over, this artist came to this mansion, knocked on the door, the butler comes to the door and said, could I see Mr. Smith? He said, I have something special for him. And so Mr. Smith comes down, obviously the years and the grief had taken his toll on this old man. And he introduced himself as his army buddy and he showed him the picture he sketched of him. And he so touched the old man. Then years later, the old man died. And they were going to auction off his multi-million dollar art collection. And so all these art snobs were out there ready to pounce on the Rembrandts and the Picassos. And the auctioneer starts off. He said, well, we have one, the first item up for auction today is this picture, it's hand drawn by this man's friend. And he picks up this picture and he says, what do I get, what do I get? Do I get $5, do I get $10? He's trying to get somebody to give him a bid, give him a bid. To $10, $20, would you give me a bid? For this, is, this was driven, drew, drawn for the man's son while he was in Vietnam, sadly he was killed, nobody's bid, and they're all saying, come on, come on, come on, let's get to the good stuff. He said, well, do I get $5, $5, nobody give me $5, do I get $1? Finally, some guy says, uh, I'll give you one dollar because they didn't have any money. And it was the artist. And then all of a sudden, the gavel comes down and he says, that's the end of the auction. And everybody said, oh, 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 what about the other stuff? He said, the man said in his will, whoever buys that picture gets all of it. And the moral of the story is, he who has the son, Jesus, gets it all. When you have Jesus, you've got it all. You don't need drugs. You don't need alcohol. You don't need promiscuity. You don't need sinful life. You don't need sexual immorality. You've got it all. You've got Jesus. Do you? That's what I'm trying to tell you. When you give your life to Christ, you have it all. I'm not going to have heaven someday. I'm going to be, but I have it now. Heaven is in my destiny. Heaven is in my navigation system. Hallelujah. And you know how to get up to heaven? Get down on your knees. The way up is down. Humble yourself. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will heal their land and forgive their sin. People, America needs repentance. But you need repentance. 
Somebody sent me a message the other day. I sent a message on repentance. And this lady, dear lady, I don't don't like to hear about repentance too much because I'm safe. Listen, repentance is a lifestyle. Safe you're not. We make mistakes. On my best day, on my best day, I need to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I know I screwed up somewhere. I tell them that all the time. Lord, forgive me of the sins that I know I've done today or the things I should have done and I didn't do and the things I only know I did. Please forgive me. Because my my glory next to his glory that they don't compare. I want you to know, my friends, that God has a plan for your life and this is eternity I'm talking to you about. I want you to start thinking eternity. Stop thinking about the here and the now. Are you ready to meet Jesus? There's a one-year-old child that we prayed for today who was burned in 65% of his body. One year old. I believe he's going to come through it. But nobody expected that to happen. Some lady posted on Facebook yesterday, I was walking outside Walmart, somebody got hit by a car right in front of me. You don't know when your day is going to come. Don't put off for tomorrow what has to be done today. Here's what I'll tell you. It is appointed unto man first to die and then the judgment, the Bible says. It's appointed unto man first to die, you're going to die, and then there is a judgment. You say, well, I don't believe it. Guess what? You're going to, you're going to be standing in your unbelief because you're going to stand before God every single day. I don't care if you believe it or not because one day you're going to believe it. And by then it'll be too late. Sometimes I feel like John the, the, the Baptist was trying to tell people, wake up. Prepare you the way of the Lord in your heart. Make your crooked ways straight. Make your valleys low. God is going to raise up the valleys and bring down the mountains. Get ready, people. I want to see some of you in heaven. Now, the devil is an adversary you've got to really know about. Verse 14, 15, he says, but each person, when he is tempted, he but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Satan's like an expert football coach who has all the film he needs on you. You know how when you're a football coach, you get film from the team you're playing, or if you're a fighter in, in the UFC, you get film, you learn. The, the way people are. Satan knows your film, and he knows how to tempt you. He knows where you're weak. He knows where you're strong. And he knows how to push your buttons. And so it's not a sin to be tempted, but it's a sin when temptation turns into completion, when you go along with it. When you're tempted, that's because the devil wants you to fall. And when he can't make you fall, that makes him very, very upset. He knows how to appeal to, to the evil desires in your heart. Friend, I just want you to know I'm in Cooper. He, the hour is late. I'm 58 years old. I lived through the 60s. I remember when Martin Luther King was murdered. I was, I lived in Virginia, but just outside of Washington, I could see the fire on the steps of the Capitol. I met Bobby Kennedy before he was assassinated. I met Teddy. I, my father worked in the government, so I met all these guys, right? And we went through all that. I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anything like this. This is, this is sinful. Our nation is in trouble. And common Joe and Sally out there, they're not going to do anything about it. The only thing that's going to save our country is Jesus Christ. The only thing that's going to save our country is Jesus. And the only thing that's going to save you is Jesus. So we as a church, we've got to come together. We've got to get our hearts right. Quit being so selfish and live for yourself. You know something? I'm going to leave you alone in a minute. Jonah. Jonah was told by God to go to Nineveh and warn the people of Nineveh to repent or God was going to destroy them. Well, Jonah didn't want to do that because he knew the Ninevites were unrighteous people and he was going to run from God. You know the story. He gets on the ship. He's going to run from God. While he's on the ship sleeping, the boat is being tossed like a, like a bathtub toy and the people on the boat are thinking somebody has done something against God. So they're all praying to their God asking, help, help, help. Finally, somebody finds Jonah sleeping and they're saying, who is your God? And why are we going through all this? And Jonah said, it's my fault. I'm running from God. Throw me over. So they throw Jonah over and he gets swallowed by a large fish. Probably a whale. 
I believe it happened 100% of you. Yeah. So he, uh, I've been after a few days in the belly of this fish. God changed his mind. Can you imagine this fish spitting up this bleach washed Jonah onto the beach? Then he decided he was going to tell the truth. Then he was going to go preach the gospel. When God calls you to do something, you don't have a you don't have a say so. God said, "Go, you go." We are selfish. Jonah got in trouble because he was selfish, and the reason why I'm saying this to you is this. Jonah's disobedience made everybody in his life and everybody on that boat was in jeopardy because Jonah was disobedient to God. I do not want to be responsible for someone's trouble because I disobeyed God, do you? If God's calling you, some of you guys here, God has called you to life a long time ago. And you know it. And he knows it. It's time to answer it now. He called you just for this hour that we're living in. So you got to stop living for yourself. you got to stop being selfish. And you got to start giving your life to Christ and living for Jesus. Friend, it's the greatest decision I ever made. 35 years ago, I can't hardly believe it. Walking with Jesus. God took me. He accepted me. He took me the way that I was. I didn't go get cleaned up first. I didn't go get cleaned up and get off the drugs and the alcohol and party and all the stuff I was doing. And then come say, hey, okay. God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't love Billy Graham anymore than he loves you. He doesn't love Moses anymore than he loves you. He doesn't love me anymore than he loves you. He loves us all the same. He's offering us all the same grace. So what I'm asking you today is, if Jesus were to come today, if there was a trumpet blast, because the day he's going to come, there's going to be a trumpet blast, and those who are in Christ Jesus are going to rise first. And then those who are alive are going to be caught up in the air with him in the sky. Are you going? Have you got your airline ticket? <laughs> Is your re reservation punched? Because if you're a born again Christian, you're going. But if you're not, you're not. And it's just going to be like that. He said, I'm going to take the sheep from the goats. I told you that before. The sheep who enters into the kingdom, the goats are going to be taken out and burned. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Have you repented of your sins? Repentance means change direction. It doesn't mean being sorry for your sins. We're all sorry when we're caught. Repentance means this is the way I was going. God shows me a new way. I come to my senses and I change direction and I begin to live a new way. That's how I, that's what happened in my life. And I'm, I'm telling you, if you'll trust Jesus, he'll do the same thing for you. Some of you guys knew me a long time ago. Some of you guys, this is the only Steve you ever knew. But the people who knew me knew, and they know, what you see here is not who I was. And it's only by the grace of God. I don't know why he wants to use me. I'm not even worthy to say this on my lips in reality. Are you ready to come to Jesus? Are you ready to quit fighting against God? Quit trying to figure him out. Quit judging God. Quit being mad at God. And say, God, I need you. I need you desperately. I want to be saved. I want to change the direction of my life. I want to change my destiny. I want to be your servant. I want to work for you and not against you. I want to do what you want me to do, not what I want you to do. I don't go anywhere unless the Lord leads me. People call, will you come here? Come here? I think people think I'm a snob. I'm not. But if I'm not lit, I don't go. Because what if I'm supposed to be here and I'm over here because I think I'm supposed to be over here and I miss the opportunity because I'm supposed to be over here. I want to be led by the Lord. So if there's anyone who would say, I want to be saved. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to trust him from this day forward. I know I've made a lot of mistakes. God knows it. Guys, he sees it all. He knows it all. And he's still saying, come to me. All you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I love you with a love that is undescribable, indescribable. If there's anyone in this room that says, that's me, I want, I want to give my life to Jesus. Put your hand up right where your hand is at. I, I want to be saved. I'm so sorry, Lord, for living the life that I do. I've offended a holy God. That's